All right. Thank you all for, for waiting. Uh, we've had some technical difficulties here. Um, it's, it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Ashish Gokarni. Um, his presentation is going to be on stimuli responsive nanomaterials for imaging immunotherapy response. Uh, he's an assistant professor in the Department of Chemical Engineering at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, and he has uh, courtesy appointments in the Departments of Chemistry and Biomedical Engineering. Uh, and he was recently selected as one of the top 12 rising researchers by uh, ACS's uh, Chemical and Engineering News. Um, so I will uh, move on to uh, his presentation now. Good afternoon. I would like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to share our work here today. Our lab works on addressing two important challenges in cancer immunotherapy. The first one is can we design nanoscale approaches to target immune suppression, specifically targeting immune suppressive cells in the tumor microenvironment with the hope that we can relieve immune suppression, activate the immune response that can lead to significant tumor degradation or anti-tumor defense. And the second one is can we design imaging probes that can allow us to monitor the immunotherapy response early on. So today, I'm going to share our recent work on designing imaging nanoprobes that can indeed allow us to monitor the immunotherapy response early on. To go one step further, we have shown that we can not only sensitively monitor the immunotherapy response, but we can also differentiate between sensitive tumors and non-responsive uh, tumors and non-responsive tumors. But before going to that, I would like to talk about some of the challenges that are there in monitoring immunotherapy response and how we are addressing those challenges. Now, as you all know, immunotherapy has had and continue to have a significant impact on, um, on cancer patients. Immunotherapy ha had dramatic uh, responses in what are the different types of aggressive tumors, hard to treat tumors. So this has had a dramatic impact on how, uh, on different types of uh, cancer patients. Indeed, if you pick up any leading journal or a magazine, they have considered immunotherapy as a breakthrough, something that has a potential to cure cancer. Now, considering this excitement, there are several clinical trials that are uh, currently uh, being conducted. This is in 2018. Uh, the number of clinical trials you see either as a monotherapy or in combination with current therapies. And um, CTLF-4, which is one of the immune checkpoint inhibitor, has more clinical trials going on than combined chemotherapy and radiotherapy. So there is a significant excitement. There are a lot of clinical trials that are going on. And despite this initial excitement, there are several challenges that were identified uh, that hampers the successful use of cancer immunotherapy in, in, uh, in clinics. One of the biggest challenge is that these immunotherapy treatments show low response rate. For example, pembrolizumab anti-PD-1 antibody has shown overall response rates of around 20 to 30 percent in variety of different types of tumors. Variety of different types of tumors. Now, this can have a significant impact on the quality of life of patients because these patients are going through these uh, treatments without uh, a guarantee of response, without knowing this this will help or not. And you know they have to go through unnecessary toxicities of these treatments if they're not going to help uh, the, the tumors. There's additional complication in, in immunotherapy is that it does not follow conventional resist criteria. Now resist criteria, which is response uh, evaluation criteria in solid tumors, these are guidelines that were developed in order to evaluate if cancer therapies are working or not, and to get an idea about disease progression versus overall response. Now, immunotherapy treatments does not follow this conventional criteria because it has additional patterns of immune responses that were never observed with any, any other treatments. Just to give an idea about what those responses are, um, you know, there, there could be an initial response which shows that the, the treatment is working which are, because of which there's a regression in the tumor volume. Or there could be a stable disease where um, the tumor volume remains same uh, even after uh, several uh, several uh, therapy treatments. Or there could be a disease progression where the tumor keeps growing even after several uh, cycles of therapies. 
Now, in case of chemotherapy or radiation therapy, the responses that were shown were either there's an initial response where there's a tumor volume regression, or there's a disease progression that happens, uh, you know, even after several cycles of therapy. So this is, you know, easier for using the RISIS criteria where you either have a uh, initial response where the patient is responding or not, or there's a disease progression where the patient is not responding. In immunotherapy, there's an additional uh, response that has been shown where when, when, the, when the immunotherapy starts working, it activates the immune cells and this activated immune cells then infiltrate into the tumors. This clocking of immune cells bulks the tumor up and the bulking of the tumor in, you know, can be easily misconstrued as disease progression. Indeed, currently there are no imaging techniques that can differentiate between disease progression and pseudo progression. This can have a significant impact for the patients who are actually responding but can be misclassified as disease progression and there's a chance that uh, the, the treatment might be stopped where they're actually need more treatments in order to go from pseudo progression all the way to, to tumor regression. But just, to give, just to give an idea about some of these responses that were observed in clinical trials, this is nivolumab, which is an anti-PD-1 antibody. And there, as you can see, there are different types of responses that were ob observed, where there's an initial response, or there's a stabilization of the, of the tumor, as you can see in several types, or there's an initial increase in the response followed by a regression that happened. Um, and you know, this, this has been shown to happen in variety of different types of immunotherapies inother as well. And to understand and to incorporate these responses in, in the assessment, in the RACIS criteria, there were modified guidelines that were developed. So uh, this is called RACIS 1.1. Now, I know this is a busy slide, but I want to point uh, your attention to uh, one of the initial response patterns where there's an increase in tumor volume, which is considered as a progression or unconfirmed uh, progression. In this case, the patient is given the treatment whether the disease is progressing or not, which means that if, if there's a disease progression or pseudo progression, the patient is, uh, you know, continue to give the treatment till it is identified that the, the tumor is going down or not at later time point. And this can have a significant, significant impact. As I mentioned, the patient are going through this treatment for longer period of time without the promise of the uh, response and having toxic effects because of this treatment. So we wanted to think about can we design imaging systems that can allow us to, to get a response at much early, uh, much early on as compared to morphological changes that happen at later time point? And to understand that, we wanted to see how does immune response work? Uh, so just to give you a highlight about uh, immunotherapy response cycle, there are different steps, uh, major steps in immunotherapy response cycle. Now, release of cancer antigens happens because of chemotherapy, radiation therapy, or targeted therapy. These antigens, because of the immunological cell death, these antigens are then captured by antigen presenting cells which are circulating. Uh, once they are taken up, the antigen presenting cells then uh, mature them and present these antigens once they traffic to the lymph node to the naive T cells. And these T cells then get primed and activated. And these activated T cells then traffic uh, through the blood vessel to the tumors. And once they go inside the tumors, then they can recognize the cancer T cells that are presenting those antigens. And once they know that they are binding to the target cell, then they can release um, uh, molecules that can kill the target cell. Right? So killing of the cancer cells happens. And there are several types of therapies that are currently uh, being investigated or already approved that target different, uh, that activates or targets different pathways in the, uh, in the immunotherapy response cycle. Now, there are also several types of um, uh, assays or techniques that have been developed in order to monitor the response at different stages. One of the most prominent being uh, identifying the T cells that are there, um, either circulating or in the tumor. And you know, some of these assays I have listed here, and I'm not, I'm not going to go through all, uh, all the assays here, but just to highlight uh, some of the challenges with this. These assays have high degree of variability. They are often non-reproducible, which makes it difficult to kind of use this as a basis for response, uh, whether the patient is responding or not responding. The, as I said, the immune response is in a complex. There are multiple types of immune cells that are involved in inducing the immune response. So just finding out one type of cell or understanding a, you know, the, the kind of uh, response from one type of cell 
might be too simplified and you know the immune response is very complicated and it's, it's very difficult to kind of get a complete picture of the immune response by just understanding one type of cell. Um, you know, most of the assays generally uh, try to try to get uh, the T cells that are circulating, but the systemic immune response could be very different than what happens at the tissue level in the tumor. Uh, so, you know, and, and in this, you know, if you want to design an assay where you can get tumor samples, it's only available for tumors that are accessible, right? So having systemic immune response does not mean that the tumors are responding. And even if you get the tumor samples through biopsies, they're only accessible, they only can be done to accessible tumors. So these are what are different types of uh, challenges that are observed in uh, T cell immune response assays. There are biomarkers that can be identified that can predict the response, but there are no clear biomarkers that have uh, shown validity in the clinics that can be used uh, as, as, as a way to, uh, to get a prediction of the response. Imaging assays have been developed, for example, imaging techniques such as MRI. Uh, one of the challenges MRI, as I mentioned, is pseudoprogression, right? You're measuring the, the morphological, gross morphological changes that happens once, once the immunotherapy treatment are given. This could be easily misclassified as a disease progression. So discordant anatomical changes makes it very hard to, to differentiate between pseudoprogression and disease progression or response, responsive versus non-responsive tumors or tumors that respond late. FDG PET can be used and widely used for monitoring response patterns, but in case of immunotherapy, this can have an uh, have you know impact because the immune cells that are infiltrating in the tumor are you know need glucose for their uh, activity, and this can give a lot of false positive. Same issues, it can give, um, you know, if the tumors are responding, it can be easily misclassified uh, as a disease progression. So this uh, imaging techniques lack the sensitivity and specificity in monitoring the response. Indeed, in, in our uh, studies, we have shown that just measuring anatomical changes takes longer time. And this is in my studies, as, as, uh, uh, as we have seen here, that it takes much longer time to, to get uh, a significant response. Same is the case with page CT. We, you know, we see that it takes longer time in order to understand if the tumors are responding or not. And you know, having having this uh, uh, having this uh, limitations where sensitivity and selectivity uh, is, is one of the challenge in monitoring immunotherapy response. So we wanted to kind of uh, step back and see what is it that we can do in order. What are the what are the um, what is the step that we can uh, monitor the immune response, which happens at much earlier time point than morphological, gross morphological or anatomical changes. And that can be used as a direct read of of immunotherapy response. So we want to see, can we use killing of the cancer T cells or monitoring of T cells killing the cancer cells in the tumor microenvironment as a way to monitor the response early on, as a way to directly monitor the response uh, early on. This has several advantages. First thing is that we are not, you know, we can we are measuring tissue level response, which means that it will be very representative of what happens in the tumor. Now we are measuring that the T cells are actually binding and killing the cancer cells, which means that this is a direct readout of T cells, not only infiltrating the tumors, but actually actively killing the tumor cells. And since, as I said, this is a tissue level response, this can be, um, you know, much, much different than what happens at the, at the uh, circulation at the systemic level. And, you know, even though you have activated T cells that are circulating, that does not mean that the T cells will persist for a long period of time or go in the tumor, in immune suppressive tumor and keep that activity, right? So we have a lot of uh, T cells that might be circulating that are active against the tumor cells, but they might go into tumor, uh, immune suppressive tumor and lose their activity, or, or they might not be able to infiltrate in the tumor at much higher concentration. So, you know, it, monitoring this, uh, at, that happens when T cells are binding to the tumor cells and actively killing the tumor cells would be a direct way of measuring the response uh, in real time. So we want to design imaging probes that can not only allow us to deliver the immunotherapy drug to the tumor, specifically a tumor at much higher concentration, but can actually tell us in real time whether the treatment is working or not. Uh, in order to understand how can we design the systems, we wanted to step back and see 
uh, how do T cells kill target cells in this case tumor cells. So cytotoxic T cells, when they are once they are bound to the tumor cells, uh, ident once they uh, identify the the antigen and bind to the antigen, they can kill the target cells by two different mechanisms. One is granulocyte uh, exocytosis pathway, granulocyte ex exocytosis pathway, which is granzyme purpurin. So cytotoxic T cells can release granzyme and purpurin. Uh, the granzyme is an enzyme that can activate caspases. Purpurin is a pore forming uh, protein that can uh, you know, let, let the granzymes uh, get into the cancer cells. And then this um, granzyme B can then activate the ca caspases and then lead to apoptosis. Or uh, it, would, it can be a death receptor, death receptor ligand pathway, which again activates the caspase three and seven. So we wanted to think about uh, about imaging probes that can allow us to monitor these interactions, monitor this this type of um, changes that physiological changes that happens when thyroid T cell is actively killing the tumor cells. So one of the things that we designed was um, imaging probes that can allow us to monitor uh, the caspase three levels. Uh, that would be a direct readout of tumor cells dying because of the uh, thyroid T cells after T cell uh, after immunotherapy treatment or design imaging probes that can monitor the granzyme B levels in the tumor cells uh, as a way of um, as a way of monitoring the immune response. So today I'm going to talk about our recent work on designing uh, granzyme B imaging probes that were used to monitor the response in immunotherapy responsive as well as non-responsive tumors. So the design was um, we use a polymeric backbone which has multiple functional groups that can be either conjugated, that can be conjugated to an immunotherapy drug and an activatable imaging agent. This activatable imaging agent has a granzyme B substrate and an imaging agent, which is uh, in the off condition. But when there is an immune response, this granzyme B can clear off the substrates and activate the imaging agent, which can be used as a direct readout of immunotherapy, direct readout of T cell killing the tumor cells. Whereas if there are no, there's no immune response, there will not be a uh, release of activated granzyme B and it will not activate the imaging agent and we'll see that the tumors are not responding. Uh, and we call this granzyme B nano, report, nano reporters or GRB, GNR. So we designed uh, this uh, granzyme B nano reporters by um, using a polymer backbone that was conjugated with uh, Carboxypeg amine uh, with polyethylene glycol uh, amine and Granzyme B Pro, which has a, dye and, uh, a quencher and a dye. They are in close proximity, so the dye is in a quench state, which means that the signal would be off. And we, uh, once we uh, incubate this in in, uh, uh, in in optimized concentration, we get a polymer construct, and then we can uh, sonicate this in uh, in an aqueous solution to form a self-assembled systems. Uh, with with the pegylated um, uh, pegylated uh, 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 pegylated group on, on the surface that can be conjugated with anti pdl one antibody, any antibody in that case, but we have conjugated anti pdl one antibody as a proof of concept. And you know, once we have this, we have characterized it for the size, stability, uh, the functional groups, uh, the amount of antibody that was conjugated, and whether it binds to the the cells or not, whether it binds to pdl one expressing cells or not. And then we tried, does it actually induce uh, a response uh, in, in, in a co-culture assay with T cells and, and, and cancer cells? So we have used B16 uh, OVA, which is very widely used cancer cell that expresses OVA antigen, and B16 F10 as a control cell uh, or, or, or low responsive cells. And we have OT1 T cells that binds to the uh, antigen on the tumor cells. And we have shown here that when we treat it with the, with the GNRs, uh, using uh, B16 OA as well as OT1 cells, we get much higher activation of the granzyme B reporter as compared to the B16 cells. And we have also optimized the ratio of uh, T cells to cancer cells. And as you can see here, we see a much higher and specific response in B16 F10 OA cells as compared to B16 F10 cells. So we, we know that it is very specific, it's very sensitive. The question was, can we now use this probe to, to monitor the response in vivo. So same as, as I said, we have designed, uh, this was using the, the, UV, active, uh, the UV range uh, fluorescent FRED pairs. We also designed using near infrared uh, pairs, which can be used for live mice imaging. And we have designed a probe where 
that can be inject, uh, injected into the mice, where the idea was for highly responsive tumors, when uh, there's an activation of immune response, it will lead to act, uh, release of the granzyme B. The granzyme B can clue off this um, substrate that will activate the dye, and you can use that as a, a direct way of uh, monitoring the immune response, where the tumors will light up if there's an immune response. Whereas in poorly responsive tumors, we will not, we, you know, we'll, uh, we uh, hope that it, it does not activate the immune response and you'll not have activation of the dye and, you know, and say that the tumors are responding because the signal would be in off condition. Now, to, to understand that, we designed a tumor uh, system where in the right flank, uh, we had a highly responsive tumor, which is MC38, because MC38 has been shown to, to have, uh, uh, it's shown to respond to immunotherapy at, you know, uh, in a highly responsive manner. Whereas B16F10, even though it, it responds, the response has been shown to be very poor compared to MC38. So we had on left flank B16F10 and on right flank MC38. Uh, and we also used uh, IgG isotype control uh, systems that can allow us to monitor the response uh, and, and, uh, and, and control as, as a control. And when we use, uh, when you use alpha p delamantable, you can see here that we see a response. Uh, as the time goes, we see a higher activation in the re uh, highly responsive tumors as compared to low, uh, as compared to poorly responsive tumors. And control uh, IgG uh, GNRs do, do not really show any activation. As you can see here, we have significant activation of, of the signal in the tumor. There's a higher tumor to normal tissue ratio in, in the highly responsive tumors as compared to poorly responsive tumors. And this is when we injected alpha PDL1 uh, GNRs. It should be GNRs here, uh, sorry. And then we have, and, and we, uh, you know, interestingly, we see that there's not much tumor volume changes that happens, which means that uh, we have used much lower doses uh, to, to kind of see whether can we use lower doses to monitor the response early on as compared to uh, much earlier than any morphological changes that, that could happen. So indeed, we have shown that we can not only distinguish between highly responsive and poorly responsive tumors at much lower concentration, we get a response much earlier than uh, morphological changes that could happen in the tumor. And to validate this, we uh, did ex, you know, ex, ex vivo assays where we isolated the tumors after 48 hours of the, of the uh, treatment. And we see that tumors lights up in, in MC38, uh, and these are three MC38 tumors, whereas B16F10 tumors don't show as much response. And you can see when we quantify the, uh, the fluorescence, MC38 had much higher signal as compared to B16F10. And this correlates with higher granzyme B expression in uh, PDL1 uh, GNRs uh, as compared to IgG or vehicle, it has much higher CD8 uh, expression uh, in the PDL1 GNRs, again, in case of. MC38, which is highly responsive tumor, as compared to B16F10. And we see that there is a higher level of granzyme B and fluid caspase 3 uh, in, the, in the tumors, in this case, in the PDL1 tumors, as compared to, um, compared to non-responsive tumors, or even in PDL tumors as compared to uh, the, the uh, vehicle or, uh, or uh, control IgG uh, nanoparticles, uh, control IgG uh, GNR. Next, we wanted to see, can we actually use it? Can we increase the doses of the systems in order to uh, see if we can higher, can higher doses lead to better response? So we use B16F10, but in this case, we use three times more doses that then were done in the previous trial. As you can see here, when you increase the doses, you see that there's an improvement in the response that was observed, even in poorly responsive tumors. As you can see here that we see, as the time goes, we see, uh, much, much higher response in, in the, um, in the uh, PDL1 uh, GNRs as compared to IgG uh, GNRs. And we can see here there's a response much higher as compared to uh, control IgG. Again, here we do not see that even at higher doses, there's not much changes in the tumor volume. But this is again an earlier time point. We see that we can see a response as early as 24 to 48 hours where the tumor volume, uh, even in seven days, we did not see a significant changes in the tumor volume. Again, this means that we can use activatable systems uh, to, to monitor the response much, much earlier time point than gross morphological changes without having any toxicities. Again, we have validated this by, uh, by monitoring uh, the activity of uh, CD, uh, CD T cells in the tumors 
transient B levels, um, the, the, uh, the cancer cell death, uh, and, you know, and, and also understanding that having uh, higher granzyme B correlates with higher response, higher caspase level correlates with higher response as well. So the first time we have shown that we can design this activatable imaging probes that can allow us to monitor the response in real time, distinguish between highly responsive versus poorly responsive tumors. And this, uh, you know, this response on, um, imaging can happen at much earlier time point than morphological changes. And if you increase the doses, we can also see the response in poorly uh, responsive tumors. And we have recently, uh, uh, this paper has recently been accepted in Science Advances. Uh, so with that, I would like to um, conclude that we have designed imaging probes that can allow us to monitor the immunotherapy response early on. And even though this is proof of concept study where we have used fluorescent based systems, we are currently working on designing uh, imaging probes that can allow us to use clinically validated systems that can be used for uh, clinical translation and you know, hoping to have some exciting data uh, in next uh, year or two. With that, I would like to um, thank all the amazing students we have done all the work. So today's work was mostly done by An, um, Anujan, Anthony, and, and Deepika. And um, uh, undergraduate students, technicians, and postdocs in my lab, and uh, uh, my collaborators who have, uh, for example, Barbara and Leonid have uh, helped me in some of the uh, transgenic uh, assays that we have shown and the funding agencies for, uh, for, for their support and for trusting in our, our work. And I would like to thank you all for listening and I'll be happy to answer any questions. All right, thank you, Ashish, for that presentation. Um, we're gonna move on to the Q&A portions, and it looks like we're having a little bit of technical difficulties here with Ashish's camera, um, hopefully. <laughs> Great, you are here, though. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we've got a few questions coming that in. That is strange. Um, one second, I'm not sure why my camera is off. Okay, all right. Can you all see me now? I don't think so, but I guess we should probably move on to the questions. Okay, um, go as ahead. Long as go ahead. Can, as long as yeah. you can answer. Um, so we've got a couple of good ones here. Uh, was there any toxicity uh, observed? Um, and that's a great question. I mean, you know, that's something that we want to extensively uh, analyze right before we go to the next step of clinical translation is to understand uh, what are the toxicities that are there for either short term or long term toxicities. And, uh, you know, for, for this studies, uh, for the um, for the doses that we studied, we did not see any toxicities. At least we did not see any liver and spleen toxicities. Uh, but again, there is we are working on doing extensive analysis of all the toxicities that is required. Uh, but that's a great question. Um, could this imaging platform work uh, on other types of immunotherapies, such as uh, CAR T cell therapy? Um, yeah, I mean, that's a great question. You know, one of the, I mean, in this proof of concept studies, we have uh, done it with immune checkpoint inhibitors, which is easy to do because they are antibodies that can be easily conjugated. For CAR T cell therapies, is a little bit tricky just because we want to make sure that we have, uh, you know, the, the, the spatial temporal dynamics is a little bit something that we need to optimize in order to get um, the capture, the sensitivity and selectivity, right? That is different for different immunotherapies. Uh, so we mm -hmm. are working on designing, and obviously, this platform can be used for monitoring response for CAR T cell therapies. And then we are currently working on uh, designing the probes that can be adapted for CAR T cell therapies and see how we can use those for monitoring the response uh, for, for those type of therapies as well. All right. Thank you. So um, I'm going to ask one more question until I get yeah. the signal that we've got to um, go off the air here. Um, what is the size of the assembled probes and could that affect the tumor penetration of the reporter? Uh, that's a great question. And that's been one of the, one of the 
talk of the uh, nanomedicine field or, or imaging probes that are in the nano scale is what is the optimum size and how much do you get in the tumor, right? And that's always going to be important to increase sensitivity as well. Um, so the size that we saw was around 100 nanometers, which is optimized, 100 to uh, 100, uh, 200 nanometers, which is kind of shown to be an optimized size for uh, better tumor accumulation. But again, we are working on, uh, and we have done some initial studies to see, do we actually get better tumor penetration? or not. Uh, and we indeed see that we get uh, enhanced tumor penetration compared to uh, any of the free uh, systems. But, um, you know, we are working on systems that can allow us to get a little bit smaller size as well, but without compromising the size, the stability, as well as accumulation and, and have the enough amount of drugs. We are working on optimizing some of those parameters, fine tuning those to, to kind of enhance the efficacy. But that's a good question. There's another question that just came in um, yeah. talking about how T cell therapy is highly selective. And uh, is your system more suitable for a certain type of cancer or tumor? Uh, for, for, for T cell therapies, you know, we are thinking about uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors, right? And the question that comes is uh, how do we know if this immune checkpoint inhibitor will work in the patients or not? So, thinking about uh, clinical scenario, we, you know, ended for any type of immu immunotherapies, there is a uh, as, you know, side test or diagnostic test, uh, which is kind of approved by FDA that uh, that kind of, uh, you know, analyzes if there is a higher PD-1 or PDL one expression or not, and is there a likelihood of patient responding to those. I think that would be a better way to go about is to see uh, which, which type of tumors are most likely to respond, uh, if they're going to respond at all. Uh, but, you know, that, that test... Uh, you know, might not be very, very uh, effective or selective because there are some tumors that did not have uh, PDL1 expression responded. So I think you know there is some work that needs to be done in order to figure out what would be the the best tumors or what would be the best suitable systems to try with. Uh, but you know, the, for proof of concepts, we went with tumors that shown efficacy in the mice model. For clinical uh, studies, we will basically you know will work with the uh, system that can uh, give us an idea about what expression levels are there and then choose those immunotherapies. All right. Well, thank you very much. I, I think we're running out of time. So uh, I think you'll have an opportunity to, to follow up with some of the, the remaining questions. Okay. Um, so thank you, thank you again uh, for the presentation and, and thank you all for participating. Thank you so much.